So I'd like to talk to you today about the T in TEDx. Now, the T in TEDx actually stands for technology. So I'll take you on a journey, actually starting with my personal journey uh, of technology, but also look at what society is doing with technology and where that's going to take us. Now, my personal journey started probably in the 70s, so a few decades ago, uh, when we got our first social networking device. And it looked like this. Amazing, right? <laughs> so things have moved on a little bit since then. But this really did the trick. It helped us network with our extended family. We arranged family get-togethers, and much better than waiting outside a phone box in the rain. Now, about a decade later, uh, I got addicted. I got one of these. So this was my first computer. Uh, and I loved gaming on it, programming on it, and it, it really, it was something I was good at. So naturally I became addicted and spent a lot of time on it. Now fast forward another decade, I got one of these. Now for the first time, I was able to stay in touch even though I wasn't at home. Now it looks like a brick by today's standards, but, but certainly at the time it was quite revolutionary. So inspired by these gadgets, I decided to follow, follow a career in tech. Uh, and now I head up a team of engineers, actually two teams of engineers, designing the silicon chips which go at the heart of mobile devices. So really at the cutting edge of what's possible with technology. So this is my journey. Now let's take a step back and see where we're all going with technology. And that story starts a bit earlier. It starts in the 1700s when we had the first industrial revolution. Now, the first Industrial Revolution was catalyzed by this thing. This was a steam engine. It's actually a Watt steam engine. And it had two key innovations. The first one was that it had a separate condenser. That made it a lot more energy efficient. And secondly, its output power was in the form of rotary motion. So that made it a lot more useful for driving machinery. <coughs> Let's go forward about 100 years to the second revolution. Uh, this one's also known as the technological revolution. This was catalyzed by the invention of a cheap way of producing steel called the Bessemer process. Now, with cheap steel, we went crazy. We started building bridges, railways, um, and of course, with mass production motor cars. So this, again, moved us forward a long way in terms of deploying technology. The third revolution is a lot more recent. This is the digital revolution. So this is all about computers, the internet, uh, real social networking as we know it today. Really, there's a multitude of ways for us to stay in touch now. We're all very much more connected. Now, there's a fourth, re fourth revolution. Actually, many people think we're at the brink of something big. But very often, when you look in the future, you don't know quite what it is. You can't see exactly what it is. But you feel that something is coming. Um, but for sure, one of the key elements of the new thing, the fourth revolution that's coming, is going to be ubiquitous connectivity. That basically means connecting everything and everyone together. And that gives rise to this terminology called the Internet of Things. We all know what the Internet is today, but primarily people use it. The Internet of Things is when we start connecting everyday household objects to the Internet. And amazing things can happen then. So um, if we look forward a few years and see where we're going to be by 2020 with this Internet of Things, we're going to have about 4 billion connected people. But we'll have a lot more than that in terms of connected devices. There's a lot of revenue riding on uh, this new opportunity. Uh, people are going to generate revenue through different streams. We're going to have a whole bunch of new apps, not just gaming apps, but apps which then talk to this Internet of Things. And we're going to also see a lot of embedded systems you probably recognize that a lot of things around the house now have little computers in them. Um, and once you have a little computing device, a little processor, a little bit of software, you can then start to network those together. Um, and the whole system becomes a lot more intelligent. The big thing coming out of the Internet of Things is the huge amount of data. We're going to be generating absolutely mountains of data. Now, within that data, there's going to be really useful nuggets of information that we're going to have to mine and find. This is the so-called big data um, uh, technology. It's where you amass a lot of data from a lot of different devices and have some clever algorithms to process it. Now, if you're clever enough, if your algorithms are smart enough, you can actually spot patterns. You can spot trends. And once you can do that, you can actually make predictions about what the future holds. 
So in a way, this Internet of Things can start helping us to predict the future. Uh, think of it a bit like uh, weather forecasting, but on steroids. So we'll be able to, tr to predict where traffic, um, traffic will occur, maybe even the likelihood of accidents based on the weather, based on traffic patterns, based on levels of pollution. Uh, we could predict medical conditions. We can, with enough health data, we can start to predict who's a likely person who might suffer from a certain uh, medical condition and then take preemptive action. So it starts to move from what we think of as science fiction into something which we can actually deliver. But how is such a revolution possible? Well, there's a handful of technologies um, which make all of this possible now. And the one main invention which powers a lot of what we do today is this thing. This is actually a transistor. Uh, and it was invented in 1947. It's like a switch. So if you think of a living organisms made up of a lot of cells, well, electronic devices are made up of a load of transistors. And when you collect them together, um, they can do complex processing. Now, the semiconductor industry, which I'm involved in, how, our job for the past 60 years has been basically miniaturization. So we've taken that transistor and we've found ways of packing more and more onto a single silicon chip. So you can see, every decade we're moving forward tremendously. We're putting much more uh, transistors down on the same chip. So now we're at many billions of transistors uh, in a chip which is about the size of your thumbnail. You know, it's a pretty small device. Now, making things smaller has several advantages. Not only does it make it more portable, so you can put it in your pocket, but also it makes it cheaper. And that's really important because it makes it accessible. Let me give you an example. If you think of the computing power it took to put a man on the moon in the late 60s, that was a pretty big amount of computing power and computing software. You can get the equivalent computing power today in a toaster. And the, the price of the chip is about the same price as a packet of crisps. So you can see how we've really made a lot of that technology much more accessible. Semiconductors is not the only uh, innovation. We've got all that computing power. What do we do with it? Well, one of the hot topics is artificial intelligence, or AI. So I wanted to go through the evolution of AI to, um, to explain how it's moved on in the past few decades. And like a lot of technology, it starts in the realm of science fiction. And actually, one of the early um, uh, famous books about uh, artificial intelligence was Isaac Asimov's iRobot. He wrote it in the 50s. And in this, he talked about the world where we live with androids or robots. Um, the most famous part of it were the three rules he invented in that book. He basically realized that the, the robots, the androids, will need some rules to live by. So he invented a kind of moral code which was all about you shouldn't harm humans and you shouldn't allow harm to, to come to humans, so you should prevent that. So we'll come back to that moral code a bit later on. Uh, another great sci-fi movie was 2001 A Space Odyssey. Now in this one, we not only had an artificial intelligence managing the spaceship, but actually it had a personality disorder. So it had paranoia in this case, it became paranoid about the crew, um, so that was another kind of reflection on what artificial intelligence is capable of. Now let's move from science fiction to actual fact. The real system started happening in about 1980, 1990. The initial AI systems were called expert systems. And they were so-called expert systems because you programmed them with a simple set of rules about a specific problem or a specific domain. Uh, so for example, it might be about diagnosing a specific medical condition. So the real life expert would teach the computer by putting in a set of rules which says you ask this question, based on the answer you follow the flow diagram and you get your medical diagnosis. So fairly basic but embodied some degree of real knowledge in, a, in an expert system. Then we move forward. So in 97 there was a, a key point in the evolution of AI. This was when a, an IBM computer called Big Blue actually beat Gary Kasparov who was the reigning chess champion. So this was the first time a computer had beat a human at chess in a, in a real tournament. So that was a real uh, kind of watershed moment. Now you might think, okay, chess is all to do with maths and rules. It's not surprising a computer is going to be good at that. Well, in uh, about a decade later, IBM again came up with a challenge. And this time they put a computer um, called Watson into the game show Jeopardy. Now if you've ever seen Jeopardy, it's not really anything to do with maths. 
It's about English questions, about the real world, about contemporary stuff like pop stars. So the computer, to beat the human competitors, had to really have a lot of real world knowledge. It needed to understand language. It needed to also be able to judge the confidence in its own answers, uh, because you gamble a certain amount of your, your money on how strongly you feel you got the right answer. So a lot more sophisticated. Now let's look forward, where's this going? Well, probably one of the next uh, applications for AI is gonna be autonomous cars, self-driving cars. Now cars that drive themselves, we're still at the early stages, but you will need some degree of AI to be able to learn what is safe, what is not safe, to be able to predict what other people are gonna do on the road. Now remember that moral code that we talked about with Asimov's iRobot? Well, really, in autonomous cars, we're going to have to put that into action because the car is responsible for the safety of the passengers. That's a big responsibility, so it needs to know how to act. And it does raise dilemmas. So, for example, if the car, the only way the car could protect the passengers is to swerve onto the pavement, but there are pedestrians on the pavement, how does an artificial intelligence make those kind of judgments, whether to swerve or not, who to protect, who to not? They're really, really big decisions that we still have to get to grips with um, in AI. Now, along the top here, I've tried to show um, the evolution of organisms compared to the evolution of AI. So the early systems, we can say, were comparable to simple animals, worms, spiders. But as it got cleverer and cleverer, we're now probably at the level of monkeys. So you can see this has happened in a short amount of decades. So the obvious extrapolation of that is, where is this going? How long is it before AI becomes more intelligent than us? Um, it's easy to see the trend here. It's hard to see what happens next. But you can kind of guess uh, where this is going. So it's very interesting. Maybe in our lifetime, maybe in our kids' or our grandkids' lifetime, that's a real possibility that AI will, will develop that kind of thinking power. Now. There are three other innovations I wanted to mention which kind of fit into the Internet of Themes um, uh, topic. The first one is sensors. Now, we are making a lot of sensors that can sense very different things, very either minute movements, air quality, uh, traffic, even whether food is cooked or not. So a multitude of sensors um, with very sensitive capabilities, uh, but also that connectivity so they can feed all that data back into uh, the Internet of Things. Those are all coming out now. Robotics, so the ability to move around and have physical interactions with the real world. Uh, we've all seen a lot of advances in robotics in terms of the different shapes and sizes robots will come in, anything from vacuum cleaners to drones, not necessarily human, humanoid looking. So we'll see a lot more diversity in terms of the robotics um, that, that we have. The third one is cloud computing. Now, cloud computing is the terminology we use for all the computing power which is uh, hidden away in the internet, where all the servers are, where you can store a lot of data. Um, all of that is kind of hidden from us in the cloud somewhere, but actually it's physically located in buildings, <laughs> racks of servers and, and disks, um, and with a very high speed comms connection. That is what's gonna power the thinking part of the internet of things. So you can see there are three important elements here. The brains from cloud computing, the arms and legs from robotics, and also the eyes and ears in terms of the sensors. So this, you can see this could be a pretty powerful thing. It's going to reach out into a lot of uh, society and be able to interact with a lot of what we do. Now, how long is all of this going to take? That's a big question. Well, let's again look back at our four revolutions, see how long they took. Well, the first one took about 100 years to take effect from the initial conception to rolling it out to getting mass deployment. The second revolution was faster, about 50 years. Of course, the third revolution we know was about 20 years, so increasingly fast. The fourth one, well, again, it's quite unclear. We can't see specifically, but one can guess that it's going to be a pretty quick rollout. So this means we're really the first uh, generation who may be seeing two of these revolutions in our lifetime. So we're getting used to a lot of change, which happens very, very quickly. Now, when change happens so quickly, how does society react? Um, naturally, if we're going to see that amount of change that quickly, there's going to be some, uh, some pressure from society. Some people are not happy with it. Well, actually, that's 
happened several times before. When we had the first revolution, uh, the, these group of people who were called the Luddites didn't like the fact that technology was taking away their job. These guys were artisan weavers, um, and the automated mills were then taking away their jobs, uh, destroying their livelihood. So they didn't like this. They ganged together and started smashing up the mills. Now, of course, their, their, their worry was absolutely right. It did change their way of life. But they couldn't really stop progress. It is very difficult to stop progress. So ultimately, their, their cause failed. Now, do you think we could see that today, that type of reaction? Well, this is a scene from Silicon Valley in California, not so, uh, not so long ago, just a year or so ago, where the local people were banding together and basically saying, Silicon Valley, you're changing our way of life. You're pricing us out of our housing market. Um, we're being forced out. We can't go to the schools we used to go to. We can't live where we used to live. Uh, this is changing our society and not for the, not for the better. So again, I'm not sure it really stopped progress, but you can see there is the element where society has to adjust. Now think of that fourth revolution, and with the eyes and the ears and the arms and the brain, all seeing, all knowing, it's kind of scary, right? So we can expect some uh, adverse reaction, and people like Stephen Hawking and other, uh, other clever guys are basically saying, whoa, let's be cautious with this technology. We don't want to uh, move too fast. We don't want to create something we can't quite control. Um, it could be that technology starts controlling us, which is quite scary. Or it could even be that certain jobs get reshuffled and get changed, uh, as we've seen as the artisan weaver here. So jobs in society today will probably change. Now, whether that's accountants or whether that's um, uh, uh, call, call service people or even skilled people like mechanics or nurses, technology has the potential to change the employment market. And if it happens too quick, we will see problems. So despite this sort of gloomy outlook, uh, I personally have a more positive outlook in terms of where technology can take us. So I think there's probably three benefits that we can really gain from uh, with this technology journey. First one is it will free us up to be creative. I think we'll see a big boost in the creative arts, and actually we're already starting to see that, where people can spend more time worrying about being creative and creating uh, interesting stuff, which computers can't do very well, and less time doing menial stuff. It'll also give us time to solve the really big problems in society. So how do we cure cancer? How do we really crack renewable energy sources so we protect our environment? How do we avoid dementia? So a lot of big problems where if we're freed up, we can put our brain power focused uh, on all of those. And I think we'll be freed up to have more leisure time. So the current five days of working and two-day weekend goes back about 50 or 100 years. This could well give us a four-day working week and a three-day weekend. Now, that doesn't sound too bad. So one thing history tells us is that we are in control. Um, we can't stop progress. You can't uninvent this technology. But what you can do is decide how it's deployed and when it's deployed. So my call to everyone is like, make sure that technology is working for us and not the other way around. So if we do that, I think this tech journey can actually take us to a pretty cool place. Thank you.